Thanks, uh, Josh and uh, Scott, uh, for giving me the chance again to talk to uh, these young folks here. Uh, so, you know, I'm supposed to be talking about banking regulation and the crisis, and uh, usually I talk about these for 10 weeks in my PhD class. Uh, so I thought that I could probably do it in 45 minutes, <laughs> especially given that uh, this is the fifth talk for you guys, so uh, it should go fast. Uh, so what I thought I will do, I mean, the topic is pretty big, uh, is to do the following, and I'll just keep filling uh, elements here. Uh, like Josh mentioned, I uh, do work in financial intermediation and regulation. A lot of my work involves data, so I let the data speak, and then that tells me uh, what direction we should be sort of focusing on, what policy prescriptions come out of it. And I'm going to try and uh, convince you that uh, there is a lot to be learned here, uh, even though this is a pretty old and complicated problem. So what I thought I will do is I'll uh, do three things. Uh, I'll first talk briefly about why is there banking regulation, why regulation in the banking sector. Uh, and here uh, I'm hoping to sort of give you a quick brief history of uh, banking regulation. Then I think I'll uh, spend a little bit of time talking a bit about what happened in the recent crisis, the Great Recession, uh, and uh, talk very briefly about, okay, when we say regulation, why, why are we sort of talking about this uh, in the context of banking? And I'll try to tell you that it's, not, it's pretty peculiar that we talk about it in the context of banking. Uh, once we have sort of done that, uh, I'll try to uh, tell you a few things that might matter for regulation. Uh, in ways that are not as well appreciated outside. When policymakers come up with regulation, they think, yeah, it's going to happen. We say X and it immediately is going to happen. And I'm going to try to tell you that if you look at data, there are many elements which tell us that that may or may not happen at the same pace as which policymakers think uh, they might happen. Uh, I will also leave you with some thoughts about what challenges outside of what I, I will sort of talk about remain uh, some of the challenges. And uh, with all of that, having confused you how to sort of do this, I will conclude. And in the conclusion, actually, I'll try to end with an optimistic note, because all of the dot, dot, dots here are going to be a little bit pessimistic in terms of how we should be doing this. Uh, but when I conclude, I will actually try to argue that uh, uh, there is a very simple way to fix whatever the problem is. Uh, uh, we need to just have the political will. All right. So let me just start first with uh, a brief history uh, of, uh, you know, banking regulation. Uh, uh, so, you know, this is well known, but I thought that I'll put this quote here. Uh, uh, the history of U.S. banking regulation, when people have looked at it, when economic historians have looked at it, they trace it down to government and private actions around the panics, okay? Whatever panics have happened in the US, around the world, that's when all the regulation and deregulation uh, activity happens. And uh, if you sort of are thinking, well, must be around 2007, actually is a pretty old problem, okay? It's like a more than century old problem. If you want to know what a bank panic is, you probably have seen uh, Mary Poppins, uh, not the new version, uh, the one which we saw, which is the older version. Uh, if you want to know what a bank panic is, this is a quintessential uh, picture. It just says that we, as depositors, give money, put money in banks. Somehow, at some point, we think that we may not get paid, so we all show up outside the doors. If we show up all outside the doors, the bank may not have enough money to pay us back because bank takes the money and then invests in assets, which are long-term in nature, and to get the money back and pay everyone will take a long time, and there isn't enough time to do all of that. So that's the typical sort of uh, uh, view that was out there. There were lots and lots of these things that used to happen in 20s and 30s. And uh, as a result of that, in, in, in 30s, we came up with ways to prevent this, because we thought that this was not good. Uh, and one of the ways in which we thought we can prevent this is by having this uh, deposit insurance agency known as FDIC. Why? Because if they are there, uh, our deposits are guaranteed, we don't need to run to the bank, we'll get paid anyway. Uh, now, how FDIC gets financed and what it does and where the money will come from if there's a bank panic, that's a separate question. 
But, uh, uh, and there were a bunch of other regulations passed as well because people thought that there were stories, um, and, and you'll see many stories in banking as you see in other sectors. Some stories were that uh, bankers were taking too much risk, they were exploiting information in bad ways, so okay, let's make sure bankers can do X but not Y, they can do these things but not those things. There were tons of those things that happened. Okay? And then we treaded along, there was a period of calm. So if you wanted to chart how the panics have looked in the US, so that's the period that I'm talking about, the one on the extreme left. And then there was a period of calm till mid-1980s uh, when there was again a crisis, it's called the saving and loans crisis. And here the idea was, hey, we constrained the banks so much to operate in local geographies that they don't diversify. So when they get shocks, if you're operating in Palo Alto and Palo Alto sees a downturn, of course these banks are gonna go under. That's not a great idea. We need to make sure that the banks are well diversified. Uh, they should be operating in many, many geographies. And those sorts of regulations came in in the mid 1980s. We progressed along and there was a wave of globalization. Global banks were competing with US banks and we said, oh, we gotta make them competitive. How do we make them competitive? Let's deregulate because we've told them you can't do so many things and you can't be competitive with the uh, international banks. And we did that, so there was a wave of deregulation uh, in the 90s and then uh, that ultimately ended with uh, the Great Recession with a lot of uh, failures again uh, in the Great Recession. Now you might see these, this small blip and you might say, oh, but this, this seems small. If you expand this, this is what we're talking about in the Great Recession, so we are talking about around 400, 450 banks went under, and that's a pretty big deal. And as a result, there was a lot of regulation again imposed in the aftermath, uh, Dodd-Frank and so on, not only in the US, but internationally. Okay, so uh, having sort of taken you through how we have sort of thought about it, uh, there are ways in which people have tried to figure out whether we can classify uh, is the US economy, US banking system very regulated, not regulated? How does it compare over time? And the story that I told you can be put in numbers, and here is a, a way in which some researchers have tried to do it, and uh, the positive number means deregulation, and negative means regulation. So you can see in the 1930s, uh, when the number becomes negative, we regulated a lot. Then we went along in 1980s, there was a bit of a slowdown, but then there was a lot of deregulation, it went positive, that means a lot of deregulation. And then in, after the financial crisis, this number has come plummeting down, uh, even though uh, you know, right now we are talking about, well, should we deregulate, maybe we regulate it too much, and so on. Uh, so if you wanted to understand why this crisis happened here, a lot of people just look at, oh, we were deregulated and that's it. And that may or may not be the right way to sort of think about it. One way to sort of think about why crises happen or why bank failures happen is to think about what does a bank's business look like, okay? When Josh and I teach our MBAs, we know that we can't teach much. So the usual way in which we teach what banks do or what any firms do uh, is to sort of have what we call a simple Mickey Mouse balance sheet. Uh, and if you sort of want to know why there was a lot of bank failures. Simplest way to think about it is, well, they borrowed a lot of money, they couldn't pay it back. Yes, but what does that mean? Here are some numbers, okay? This is a bank in the US. Uh, this is literally what we teach in our MBA class, so I'm not kidding. Uh, on the asset side, you have loans made by banks. So say we made $100 of loans. Uh, it has to be funded from somewhere. Where does it get funded from? 95 of it comes from debt. Deposits are a part of that, and five comes from equity, which could be retained earnings, cash, whatever we have saved in the past, and so on. But that's what the balance sheet looks like. So one way in which you can sort of think about this is what's the leverage ratio? So people like to talk about debt over assets. By that metric, this would be 95% leverage. Just to give you a context, any normal manufacturing firm or a service firm in the US, the leverage ratios are around 25-30%. 30% debt over 100% assets. This is 95%. So obviously this looks like an aberration, so we decided we are not going to talk like that, we are going to confuse. Uh, so we talk in terms of a different leverage ratio, which is debt to equity ratio, just because we can. And if you look at this number, this becomes smaller, this is 19, so now you think that, oh, it's not that bad because it's 19, but really, that's the balance sheet. So what happened? Well, if you look at the typical US balance, bank balance sheet, all you need is a shock 
of 5% to your operating assets. So you made loans, you made loans to uh, borrowers uh, who are uh, you know, taking out mortgages or corporates, and let's say there's a downturn or a slowness in the market, you just need 5%. Because if there's a 5% decline in the assets, it goes from 100 to 95. First, equity gets hit, so equity becomes zero, and that's it. The firm is with the debt holders, that's known as bankruptcy. So you just need 5% shock for this to just completely fall over. And if you looked at where the US banks really were back in the day, uh, just before the uh, financial crisis happened, here is a leverage ratio of uh, who's who. And you can see that you know, a lot of these are in the high 10s and 20s and so on. All that sort of tells you is the banking system was extremely highly levered. If it's extremely highly levered, slight perturbations in the prospects in the economy, like slowness in house prices, or corporates not having as much demand out there, can easily lead to lots of banks going under, which is what sort of happened. Now, just because there is a shock and equity holders get wiped out and there's bankruptcy doesn't mean we should immediately do regulation. If you don't believe me, I mean, you know, here is uh, uh, a question. When you think about regulation, and if you've taken Economics 101, uh, it tells you that, well, why do we regulate any entity? In the context of banking, we suddenly talk about financial stability, all sorts of complicated words, but really, there are three things because of which we do regulation. One is externalities. If there are negative externalities, pollution, think about that. We need to do something. There could be a monopoly. So think about AT&T back in the day. A monopolist, maybe bad for consumers, need to do some regulation because markets can't fix that if you're a monopolist. Information asymmetry, where one party can exploit the other. So think about Facebook and Amazon. The whole debate right now is that they have too much information. They might be able to exploit consumers, and that's not a good deal. Markets will not be able to fix that, so we need regulation. So I told you that there was bad shocks to the banking sector, and yeah, many of them became bankrupt. But why do we need regulation? So uh, just to give you a context, here is corporate bankruptcies in the US, okay, on the left. This is all private and public firms together. You can see we are talking about thousands of firms becoming bankrupt around the year. We don't go out there and regulate them. But if I look at banks, which I just sort of talked about, as soon as we worry about banks becoming bankrupt and panics happening, we say, oh, we've got to do something. So where is that coming from? People think, and you know, there's debates around this. When I say people think, it's basically because we don't have the exact data to pin this down, but people think that when banks go under, uh, there are negative externalities. What's the idea? That look, banks are required for funds to get channeled from savers, which is depositors like us, to users who could be people in need of funds, could be entrepreneurs, whoever have you. And if banks go under, this whole channel gets broken, and that's a problem. It'll take a long time for funds to flow again, and you need banks because banks are special, they can't be replaced. So it's almost by assumption we've said that banks are special, so we've got to save them, because if we don't save them, they are special, uh, and so on. But that's the starting point. The second set of arguments which became more prominent in the Great Recession were related with the information asymmetry. So the idea was that, hey, look, bankers, they understand contracts, they understand different types of instruments much better than uh, consumers out there, and they are able to exploit their biases and all the information they have, and that's not a good deal, so we need to regulate. So for both these reasons, we have gone ahead and done regulation. The first uh, 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 reason, the runs and negative externalities, is the main focus behind most of the regulations. So when people talk about financial stability, we want a financial stability around the world, that's where they're focused on, though in the most recent times, there has also been a lot of discussion on uh, information as asymmetry and the use of uh, regulators uh, towards that. Uh, so take about, think about any regulation out there in the banking sector, your favorite. You can either put it on the asset side, so runs, externalities, or you can think about uh, the opportunistic behavior. So think about Volcker rule, CFPB, capital requirements, liquidity requirements, cyber security uh, regulation, and so on and so forth. They can all be put in these two buckets. That's just to give you a context of why we think about regulation. Now, I, 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 as I told you, we don't know the quantitative magnitude. So when we think about pollution, and when we think about carbon tax or any other tax, we have data. We have numbers. We say, OK, this is how much we need to tax. This is how much we need to subsidize. Here we are not in very good grounds. Uh, 
in terms of what is the magnitude of the externality and how should we be doing stuff, but there's a lot of beliefs out there that this is not a great thing. 